The Bank of International Settlements just revealed their new CBDC project, codename Icebreaker. Project Icebreaker, breaking new paths for cross-border payments. I'm going to expose the inner workings of this dystopian nightmare right now in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over how the current system works. You need to get your head around this so you can understand how they're going to change it. And more importantly, how you can push back against the central planners and authoritarians to make sure your kids and grandkids enjoy the same amounts of freedom and liberty that you do. Let's get right into the whiteboard. We've got the average Joe that's trying to transfer $100 to his cousin, the average Ho. Now, for those of you who watch a lot of my whiteboards, you know the average Ho is the average Joe's <laughs> Chinese cousin, but we'll assume for a moment that he is in the United States. So Joe is with bank A, Ho is with bank B. So what happens between the two banks? In this case, we'll say that they both have an account at the Federal Reserve. So one of Bank A's checking accounts is at the Fed, right here, and one of Bank B's checking accounts is at the Fed as well. Those dollars that are assets of the bank would be a liability of the Fed. Those are the bank reserves that we always talk about. All right, so Bank A calls up Bank B and says, hey, we've got to transfer you $100. You need to put it in that Ho Guys account. And Bank B says, yeah, okay, no problem. So that $100 represented by the black goes down onto the liability side of Bank B's balance sheet. But since they're transferring a liability, they also have to transfer an asset. Fine. So what happens on the Fed's balance sheet is they transfer $100 from A's account down to B's account. So at the end of the transaction, Bank A no longer has the $100 in bank reserves as assets. They no longer have the $100 liability, and that was the money they owed Joe. Now Bank B has the $100 in bank reserves, but they also have that additional $100 liability that now they owe the average hoe. <laughs> so before we go any further, I wanna point out that this first example assumes both banks have an account with the Fed and they want to settle using the Fed's balance sheet. And if you're not following that completely, don't worry about it. We're gonna explain it in more detail throughout the rest of this video. But the things that you need to know for this part of the whiteboard is this blue circle represents the fact that all of these transactions, or this one transaction that had multiple components, was in the same network. That is very key. We're gonna use that word a lot throughout this video. And they settled on the Fed's balance sheet by transferring those bank reserves denominated in dollars from Bank A's account down to Bank B. This is basically the equivalent of Bank A giving Bank B a $100 bill to compensate for that $100 liability they sent them. I also wanna point out that this transaction would be very cheap and it would be fast. Now let's assume for a moment that one of the banks doesn't have an account with the Fed, but they trust one another they have an account with one another, therefore they are in the same network. What's gonna happen is bank A is gonna transfer that $100 liability over to bank B, just like they did in the first example. But this time, they've got a few different options because the Fed isn't involved. Now, they're settling on their own balance sheets. So what I say in my videos is it's the difference between settling on the Fed's balance sheet and settling on the balance sheets of the commercial banking system, or in this case, the commercial banking network. So Bank A has an account, it's a checking account, with Bank B. That's a liability, Bank B, that's an asset of Bank A, and vice versa. Bank B has a checking account with Bank A. Really just like a retail account, like the average Joe and the average Ho. 
So since bank A just sent bank B a $100 liability, they have to compensate for that somehow. So they can either deduct $100 from bank A's account, therefore those two transactions net out, or what they can do is add $100 to bank B's account. So therefore they have an additional $100 asset, but they also have that additional $100 liability. So the main things you need to know is this transaction was in network, but the settlement process now involves counterparty risk. Why? Because bank A's account is a liability of bank B and vice versa. So bank A has all these dollars, let's say as assets on their balance sheet, liabilities bank B. So if bank B goes bust, what happens to those dollars? Poof, they're gone. And you compare that to the first example where there is no counterparty risk because those dollar assets of the bank are a liability of the Fed and the Fed can't go bust. The good news is like the first example, this transaction is cheap and it is fast. But the problems start to arise when these entities try to transact with one another who aren't in the same network. And this is when the central planners and the authoritarians come in on their white horse and say, ah, we have this CBDC solution for you. But what people need to realize is they're doing a deal with the devil. Step number two, the problem and the current free market solution. To get an overview of the problem, let's cut straight to a clip from the BIS video introducing their new CBDC project, codename Icebreaker. Communicating or sending large amounts of data around the world is cheap and easy. But sending money to another country is usually expensive and slow. The way money travels across the globe relies on many intermediaries, increasing the complexity, time and cost of transactions. One of the main difficulties is that most payment systems are designed for domestic payments, not for international payments, and often do not communicate with similar systems in another country. The reasons for this vary, for example, due to differences in legislation and technical systems, and different working hours in various countries. Now let's dive into the details as to how this works. And at the end of this video, I'm gonna tell you how you can make sure the central planners and authoritarians never implement a central bank digital currency that could threaten your freedom, liberty, and privacy. So imagine these blue circles are the individual networks. So we've got the average Joe, we've got his bank, Bank A, and then he has that $100, it's a liability of the bank. And within this network, there are other banks. We've got bank number one, bank number two, and the local central bank. And for a moment, let's just assume that bank B is in a completely separate network along with the average Ho. So none of these banks have accounts with any of these banks. So what do you do? How does the average Joe transfer that $100 over to his cousin, the average Ho? The answer is he doesn't. If there's no network, there is no transfer of money. But as you would expect, the free market figured out a solution for this. It's called correspondent banking. Here's how it works. So we've got the average Joe's network. We'll say this circle just represents the more detailed circle above. And then we've got the average Ho's network. Well, if bank A and bank B have a common bank, we'll call it M for mega bank. And let's say mega bank is domiciled in Hong Kong. Well, then they can go ahead and still make that transaction because mega bank is connecting the two networks. Here's how it would work. Through mega bank, bank A would transfer that $100 from Joe's account over to bank B's account. And they would also 
send Megabank a message saying, hey, we just transferred Bank B a $100 liability. So we need you to transfer $100 from our account at your bank to Bank B's account at your bank. So as you can see, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. But there are some catches. Number one, they're going to incur fees because Megabank ain't gonna do that for free. <laughs> and number two, when you involve all these counterparties, it's going to be a lot slower. And this assumes that Bank A and Bank B both have an account with Megabank. But as you can imagine, this system can get incredibly complex. Let's go over to this other side of the whiteboard here. And now you can see the average Joe is getting pretty pissed off. And so is the average Ho. Why? Because the average Joe's bank doesn't talk to Megabank, nor does the average Ho. So now all of a sudden, you have to get this ring of individual networks that are somehow connected by these individual banks around the world. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about. So again, let's assume that Joe banks with bank A, but Megabank is in this network right in the middle. And the average Ho banks with bank B on the opposite side of this chain of individual networks. So the good news is bank A banks with bank one, we'll say it's in this network, and bank one banks with bank two, and bank two banks with Megabank, right here in the middle. And then we'll also assume that bank B banks with bank, we'll call it C, and then bank C banks with bank D. Well, as long as bank D and two bank with Megabank, this chain of networks connects. So the average Joe can, in fact, transfer that $100 to his cousin, the average Ho. But you can see the problem here. Number one is at every link in this chain of networks, Joe or the average Ho is gonna have to pay more and more fees. It becomes very expensive. And this process is going to be incredibly slow. Why? Because we have these very human, real world elements that go into this process. Think about your average bank worker. They're on all these different time zones. They don't know what's going on. It's hard to communicate. They only wanna work nine to five. Whenever I think about this, I always think about Homer Simpson working at the nuclear plant where he's half asleep and he's, uh, he's kind of drooling and just dreaming about donuts. Let's be honest, that's the normal bank worker in this network chain. You can imagine five different Homer Simpsons, <laughs> all in different time zones, trying to communicate to one another. That hundred bucks wouldn't get there in days or hours, but it would probably take weeks to get over to the average hoe. And oh, by the way, just to send that $100, it's probably gonna cost Joe 200 bucks. So the bottom line is we do have a solution, this correspondent banking, but it is very slow, it's very expensive, but the main problem, the main issue here is that throughout this network chain, there is still significant counterparty risk because each one of these banks have to trust each other. They have to trust that the other bank isn't going to go bust because their assets, their cash assets, are a liability of one, if not multiple banks within that network chain. Step number three, the central planner's solution. Let's go right back to that BIS video where they reveal their central bank digital currency project, codename Icebreaker. Countries around the world are researching and experimenting with retail CBDCs with many pilots underway. The central banks of Israel, Norway and Sweden have joined forces with the BIS Innovation Hub Nordic Centre in Project Icebreaker, which aims to explore how retail CBDC systems can be linked together to enable efficient international payments. Project Icebreaker is exploring a specific model linking national retail CBDC systems together 
The Icebreaker Hub routes payments and allows national CBDC systems to talk to each other, despite being based on different technologies. In this project, different distributed ledger technologies used by each country for their proof-of-concept CBDC systems were connected to the Icebreaker Hub. So basically how this works is instead of having these multiple networks, now we just have one giant centralized network controlled by the authoritarians. So we've got the average Joe and we've got the average Ho. Instead of having an account with bank A or bank B, now they have a direct account with their local central bank. So if the average Joe's gonna send that $100 over to his cousin, he has to tell Jerome Powell, let's just assume he's in the United States, at the central bank, then the central bank would notify the ice breaker hub. And then this is how they would transfer currencies and whatnot to get the best rate according to their pitch. <laughs> now, how that would work, I really don't know. But the bottom line here as far as the mechanics is that $100 liability, just like before, would go on to the balance sheet of central bank number two. So it's just like bank A sending the $100 liability to bank B, in this case, central bank one sending the liability to bank two. So then the ice breaker hub is where they both, both central banks would have an account and they would transfer $100 from central bank one's account down to central bank two's account. Now I wanna be very clear. I'm using the term dollars here, but really what I am saying is the equivalent of $100. So it's very unlikely that they would have US dollars as a liability on their balance sheet. I'm talking about the icebreaker hub, which in reality, I think is the IMF. <laughs> Let's just call a spade a spade here. Icebreaker is really code name for the IMF. So the settlement asset wouldn't actually be 100 US dollars. They would be $100 in SDR, special drawing rights, which is basically the currency of the IMF. Now let's go over what you need to know and really think this through. It is true, this transaction would be fast, cheap, and secure. But I'd like to remind you that if you look back throughout history, whenever the average Joe and Jane is giving up their freedom for perceived safety and security, it never ends well. And let's remember the example they used in the video. If the average Joe is buying a camera from the average Ho, that transaction goes through Icebreaker Hub. That's why it's fast, cheap, and secure. But wait a minute here. That means the Icebreaker Hub, or the IMF, the global elite, the Klaus Schwab types, the World Economic Forum, et cetera, et cetera, would know that the average Joe purchased a camera for $100, and the average Ho sold a camera for $100. But let's replace the camera with something we know the central planners don't like, such as gold and silver. So if that transaction occurred within this network, the IMF or the Klaus Schwab types, the global elite, would know that Joe bought gold. Well, that is a no-no because we realize that the only people that buy gold and silver are domestic terrorists. And therefore, since he's obviously up to no good, we need to reduce his social score. And if we reduce his social score, well, that means it's gonna be very difficult to get that next home loan from the central bank. And if you can get it, it's gonna be at a much higher interest rate. And that's just the tip of the Orwellian iceberg. The next thing I wanna point out is this is still using dollars or the local currency. This isn't implementing Fed coin or even something that they're calling a central bank digital currency. Although they said that in the video, when they actually gave an example of how the transaction would work, they used the terminology of the local currency. They just said central bank money. But that central bank money is still denominated in US dollars, in Canadian dollars, or Chinese yuan. My point is this isn't a new currency like most people think it is. It's simply a different consolidated 
centralized network and ledger system. And the settlement asset in the local domestic economies would simply be the liabilities of the central bank, in other words, bank reserves denominated in dollars, in the case of the United States, and the settlement asset for what was connecting the two central banks would be SDRs, or the currency, the reserve asset, that only the IMF can create. So what can you do to push back to make sure this Orwellian nightmare doesn't turn into reality? Well, here's the good news. In the United States right now, a central bank digital currency is currently illegal. That's right, per the Fed's own website. They cannot do business with individuals. And if they can't do business with individuals, they can't set up the framework for a central bank digital currency. And more importantly, they can't implement that Orwellian nightmare. In other words, they can't turn 2023 into 1984. So what you can do as a citizen who values freedom, liberty, and privacy is come together with other like-minded individuals, call them rebel capitalists, the rebel capitalist community, to make sure that these central planners, these central banksters and authoritarians don't change or break the law that is there currently protecting you from them micromanaging your life. Right about now, I know there's going to be some naysayers that are saying, okay, George, well, if you look back at step number two, you yourself admitted that the current system is slow and it's expensive. So if we don't have a central bank digital currency solve this, then what do we do? Well, first and foremost, we need to remember what Thomas Sowell, the great Thomas Sowell, teaches us. There really are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. And the system that's going to create the optimal financial network is never going to come from the global elite or tyrannical government. It's going to come from the bottom up. It's going to come from a decentralized approach. In other words, it's going to come from good old-fashioned free market capitalism. Are you someone that realizes we are headed straight for an economic recession, maybe even worse? Do you also realize that the government is trying to restrict your freedom, liberty, and privacy on a daily basis? How do you protect your wealth or grow your wealth when we're dealing with a very volatile economic environment? Or how do you maintain or increase your freedom and privacy when we have this woke Orwellian government that's trying to micromanage your life? Well, fortunately, got some good news for you. I have set up an event that is focused on helping you, the rebel capitalist, find solutions to these problems. It's all set up to help you build wealth and thrive in this world of out of control central banks and big governments. That event is Rebel Capitalist Live. It's going to be absolutely incredible. It's in Orlando, May 12th to the 14th. We're going to have speakers like Peter Schiff, Mike Maloney, Lynn Alden, Chris McIntosh, Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder, Robert Barnes, just to name a few. So to get more information on how you can attend this incredible event that's going to give you actionable intel that will help you prepare for the rest of 2023 and beyond, go to rebelcapitalistlive.com and I will see you in Orlando.